We want to introduce everyone to this evening and um, thank Blue is hosting this evening. And uh, what our mission is, we are dedicated to support and improve uh, community relations with the police and first responders. And we do this through education and awareness. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, again, I want to thank all of you for coming out and taking the time. And hopefully you're comfortable and you'll be able to ask questions, things that maybe you didn't have an opportunity to ask. Tonight's your night. You can do that. And we're very honored to have Dave Sunday, our new district attorney, Pam Gay, York County coroner, with us. All right, I'll start, and then um, Dave will definitely pick up the slack there. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, law enforcement, Dave and I will both uh, uh, send our accolades to anybody in law enforcement because uh, obviously we couldn't do our jobs without them. Uh, we work, I work, my office works closely with them all the time on our cases and I appreciate everything that they do and um, the risks that they take every day. Um, and um, we're here to talk about the opioid epidemic that's going on in York County to try and give some updates for those that may um, not know what's kind of going on right now with the epidemic. Um, obviously, um, we appreciate that you are all, uh, out here trying to find out more about it. Um, we call it an epidemic because in 2014, uh, as many of you know, our drug overdose deaths went up from 13 heroin-related deaths the year before to 62 in just one year. Um, and um, right now, for 2017, year to date, we're at 128 confirmed, another 12 that we suspect that are heroin-related, <laughs> um, heroin-fentanyl-related, um, and 163 confirmed overall drug deaths. So our drug deaths have uh, reached uh, humongous proportions um, in the county, uh, the worst that it's ever been. Um, but we want you to know that there's a lot being done to try and uh, eradicate this uh, this poison among us, as well as um, at least uh, slow the deaths down and try to get treatment for those that need it. Um, we have been um, in a full forced effort since uh, I would say summer of 2014 when the Heron Task Force was first formed. Uh, Dave and I worked to form that along with many other volunteers and uh, dedicated individuals in this county, uh, as many of you know. Um, and um, there's a lot of prevention education going on in the in the uh, area right now in the county, uh, and we think that we have that down pretty well between uh, York Adams Drug and Alcohol and um, Burns Education, Not One More, and some of the other entities that are doing that, um, as well as the coroner's office. Um, and, um, you know, the York Opioid Collaborative is out doing that education frequently. Um, and uh, we're going to continue to do that. We're not going to stop. We're not going to slow down with that process. Uh, we do believe that we are reaching young people with this message. Um, it will be hard to measure that for a little while yet, um, but we, um, at this point, aren't seeing, uh, thankfully, very many young deaths uh, in the teen years um, related to this epidemic, although they do occur. Um, and, um, you know, our focus also is on getting access to those that need it, um, and those would be the individuals in their 20s and 30s and even 40s and 50s. We're losing uh, now two generations. I. Um, hesitate to say that, but we are. Um, it used to be just people in their 20s and 30s mostly, but we're losing 40s and 50 year olds and sometimes even 60 year olds to this epidemic um, because most of them, the majority of them, start out using prescription painkillers. Uh, our office is reaching out to the families through um, working with Not One More. We refer all our families to them. They work with the families. Um, we have volunteers that work with the families. Um, not only are we doing the education, we're trying to pick up the pieces afterward and help them so they can uh, move on with their lives. And um, they work with the, the DA's office. Uh, uh, some of the entities there work with the families because they're, sometimes their cases are going to trial or at least um, some sort of litigation. Um, so um, this is devastating uh, in a lot of ways to our community, uh, but yet there's a lot of hope out there because we do see people who get help, who get treatment, who recover. <laughs> 
who go on to lead productive lives. Um, and so um, that's how the coroner's office is involved. Um, I know it sounds kind of crazy because most people think the coroner's office works mostly with the dead, but in actuality, the coroner's office works mostly with the living. And that is our focus uh, on the survivors and trying to keep um, that death toll from rising and get to the point where we can hopefully see a decrease uh, in this epidemic. Um, York County's not alone. We are, uh, it, all the counties around us are experiencing this same issue. Um, and um, we just want you to understand that there's a lot of people who are working hard to, uh, to uh, combat this epidemic and uh, they will tell you more. Thank you, Pam. And also, I, I want to thank Neil and Francis um, for putting this together. You know, there's a lot of reason, you know, there's a lot of doom and gloom, a lot, that comes out. And we see it every day, and it's kind of my job, something I deal with. And Pam, you know, we're sort of at the end of the line. You have, you know, the district attorney's office, someone's getting prosecuted, and then, you know, God forbid, someone's family has to meet Pam. And so, you know, with that being said, we're sort of, you know, with that in mind, you know, there, there's reason for hope. And, there, and I mean that very sincerely. And, and there is no one answer to this problem. There's no one way to take care of it. There's no single solution. Uh, there has to be a multi-pronged approach that's not only ran by or spearheaded by law enforcement, the coroner, uh, the medical community, but it's going to take an entire village. It's going to take an entire community of concerned citizens to step up, and that's what we have here. And and you know, you took the initiative to get these people out and and get us out, and you did it very well. And, and people are here, and so I think that that is something that should be apl applauded. And so you know, I, we're, our hope is that more people will do things like that. So thank you guys very much for putting this together. Thank you. Okay. Um, with regard to law enforcement, I want to echo something that Pam said when she first started talking, and just to let everybody know, um, Pam and I can talk for a long time. And so if anyone has any questions, you know, feel free to ask because we're here, you know, for dialogue. But I want to talk about law enforcement real quick. And there's a couple points I want to make. The first one is similar to prosecutors, most police officers received absolutely no training with regard to addiction, with regard to um, what that means to an individual, how they got there, what it means to their family. And so this public health crisis, this epidemic, has created stressors on the entire justice system that previously didn't exist. And, and what I mean by that is, for example, district, assistant district attorneys, prosecutors, there is no training for them before they start their job on what any of this means, none. And so three and a half years ago when this epidemic first exploded, the reality was no one really knew what it meant. We didn't know what to do with it. Um, all we saw were these cases coming in and where people were uh, selling more and more heroin and that number was growing exponentially and the files were growing exponentially and the cases were growing. And what happened was prosecutors had to begin to understand that every file wasn't just some weird case that came through the office, it was a human being and it was family. And, and what that means is we had to learn what addiction means. And law enforcement, the police, officer, police officers had to understand and learn what addiction means. And I tell you that because right now, um, police officers aren't just answering 911 calls. Police officers are um, drug and alcohol counselors. There are people that go uh, to scenes and they talk to individuals. Uh, they have to, re they carry naloxone, the uh, reversal drug. And they, in the year 2017, there were 284 human beings that were reversed from overdose deaths by only by police officers in your county. So that's only law enforcement. Okay, and so in addition to everything else they do, and some of those individuals were, I, I hate to use the term, but Narcaned repeatedly, two, three, four, eight times. Okay, and what's happening is the heroin that we're dealing with now is really not, and I, I hesitate to say normal heroin because all heroin is terrible and bad, but 
most of the people that die now, the toxicology reports indicate that I would say about 95% of them have what's called fentanyl in their, in their system. So once again, going back to law enforcement, you know, they're doing a fantastic job. They're, you know, they're not trained originally to do this. They're all learning how to um, work with people with addiction. And that's absolutely vital because that's one of the critical components to resolving this, especially in the criminal justice system, because one of our goals as my goal as a district attorney, our goal in the, in the DA's office, prosecutors, is to be part of the solution. And the way that we can do that is understand who needs treatment, figure out ways to increase access to treatment, get them into treatment, because the goal is you want someone to be a productive member of society and hopefully be um, reunited with a family. However, along the same lines, we also as prosecutors and law enforcement want to make sure that the people that need to go to jail go to jail. And so that's a balance that we have to strike based on the facts that come out of investigations and things of that nature. Um, every overdose scene, I would say this started around a year and a half to two years ago, is now treated like a crime scene. Okay, And you may wonder, well, that's bizarre. Wasn't it treated like a crime scene before? And the answer is no. And that's across the country. So when someone overdosed and police arrived on the scene, and there is a law enforcement officer here, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say, hey, tell us about this. If he decides to step forward and start talking about it, he's more than happy. He can feel free to do that. But the reality is, um, the scenes, the people would go to the scene, the, they would find the individual that overdosed and died, and the, um, they would then go off, and that would be the end of it. And so what we're doing now is we're, we are, we meaning the district attorney's office in conjunction with the police chiefs are pushing the police officers to now treat every one of those scenes as a crime scene. Okay, and so you have a lot of police officers who traditionally wouldn't conduct an investigatory role like that that are now stepping in and they're analyzing crime scenes and they're conducting investigations. And so I'm very thankful for the work that law enforcement are doing. And just to give you an idea of how many cases that is, so right now in the DA's office, we have approximately, um, it's close to 150 cases in the pipeline that are being investigated. And that doesn't mean they're all gonna get charged. And these are people that have died. Okay, and so we do the best we can with the cases we have, and our hope is moving forward that we'll be able to continue to do that, but that has to be in conjunction with everything else. Um, and one, one other point I wanna make very briefly, as briefly as I can, is, you know, I was asked today, by, we were on a radio show this morning. Okay, I'm not gonna say which one because I don't wanna, you know, but we were on a radio show, and sure enough, because it happens every time, I get back to my office and I'm working, and I get, well, it was, I'm not going to tell you how it came to me, but I got an information from someone. I called that individual and they said, Hey, I heard you on the radio this morning. And I said, that's wonderful. How'd I do? And they're like, you did terrible because, um, here's what they said. They said, won't it just solve everything if you just let everybody die, let them die. Okay. And, and, and that's a real thing that happens. People say that to us. Uh, I don't know about you, Pam, oh, yeah. but they say it to me at least once or twice a week. And they say it with all seriousness. Every fiber of their being is dead serious about that. And so, um, and so the point I want to make while you know we're here to talk about that is, you know, a lot of people don't understand because we call it an epidemic. And when most people think of an epidemic, they think of, you know, some germs or a virus or something that you can catch. And so they're very concerned about that. I don't want to catch that. That's terrible. I don't want something bad to happen to me. Um, but what's happening? A lot of people aren't understanding the, the depth, severity, and seriousness of this epidemic because, and this is what they've told me is, well, I'm not, I don't use heroin. My family doesn't use heroin. So why should I care? And my answer to that, if any of those people happen to be here is, you should care because even if you don't have to, you, you yourself aren't using, you should care because this epidemic is not only affecting the lives of the families and the people that are using, it is absolutely, unequivocally, destroying the infrastructure of our community. And I mean that, I would say probably 70 to 80% of all the crime in your county is either directly or tangentially related to, to drug abuse, okay? Over half the DUIs in your county involve drugs, robberies, burglaries of your home. I live in Northern York County, 
I live in a place where a lot of people, de deer don't go near where I live for fear. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I'm being and, and I'm being comical about it, but the reality is, people's homes get broken into. Who breaks into them? It's someone who wants the majority of the time someone who wants to get something to sell for drugs. Okay, so even though it may not affect you directly, it affects you because our society is not as safe as it could be as a result of this epidemic. Question. Um York Adams Drug and Alcohol is actually uh, in a lot of the school districts already with programs. Uh, they have adapted their programs to address the opioid epidemic. Uh, they actually start at the elementary level in some districts with um, just basic drug education um, and then um, definitely hit it hard in the middle school, high school. Not only is York Adams Drug and Alcohol in some of the schools, not all of them, um, but also Burns Education, is uh, Burns Health Center is in the schools, as well as uh, the coroner comes in and does programs frequently in the middle school and high school. We don't go to the elementary usually. Um, and um, I know that Burns is in all age levels. Um, and then Not One More has a program that they go into school districts to at their request and uh, will often bring a recovering uh, user with them who tells their story. Um, we tend to, we bring sometimes a recovering user, but a lot of times we'll have a mom who lost somebody to heroin or fentanyl. Um, so there's a lot of different entities working together through the York Opioid Collaborative because we also go out together and do education in the schools sometimes, um, many times during the day. Um, but uh, often there's a community type presentation at night. Uh, sometimes the districts will host those. Sometimes they're poorly attended. Sometimes they're very well attended. Um, we, we say that we go anywhere anybody asks us to go. Um, we've gone to small groups as you know, five, six people um, to several hundred. Um, but there is a lot of entities working together through the York Opioid Collaborative that are doing education. We don't necessarily solicit. Uh, we get a lot of requests. And a lot of us are doing it in our spare time. Um, and um, in the evenings, on weekends, even to churches, uh, and so on. Do I think it could be improved? Sure. I think there are a lot of districts that could come on board more with it. Um, sometimes we're a fill-in at the end of the semester uh, because they need to you know, fill a, a void towards the end and get an assembly together or something like that. Sometimes it's more well thought out and planned and actually part of a, for instance, Central did a week-long curriculum with uh, many of us in the community that are involved in this effort. Um, so I give accolades to the districts that have had us out at all, and um, there are quite a few, uh, but there is definitely a gap where there are some that have not had us. Um, so I would encourage you in your own district to ask if you've had any kind, if they've had any kind of recent opioid education. Uh, it might be something that you want to bring up. Um, but like I said, you can actually check with York Adams Drug and Alcohol and see what schools they're into as part of a regular curriculum. And obviously, I think that's the most ideal, to have it as part of a regular curriculum, uh, because this problem isn't going to go away. And there's always going to be some other type of drug that pops up. Um, you know, doing an assembly is good, but only doing it once every six months to a year or whatever may not be, is actually proven not to be as effective. So mm -hmm. it's certainly helpful, but it, it's not as effective. I mean, and that's an, ex that, that's an excellent question because, um, you know, I, there are different segments of, so if you view this as a problem in the sense of just, just logically you look at this issue. We have, a, we have people who are currently in the throes of addiction. And the majority of the work with the York Opioid Collaborative, I will say, is, is geared towards those individuals mm -hmm. um, with regard to keeping them from dying. It's that simple, keeping them from dying. Um, but in addition to that, there is a whole segment of, of the population that haven't used. And it is absolutely, it is, it is imperative, it is critical that we, moving forward as a society, stop people from becoming addicted because it is, I mean, I have, the devastation is overwhelming, and the only way that we're truly going to get out of this is if moving forward, the next generation is a generation that understands how absolutely horrible this is. Now, I, I mean, we were all kids once in this room, you know, some of us more recent than others, 
Um, but the reality is, I mean, kids are dumb. And I mean that very sincerely, as I, I was one, and you know, my dad was, well, okay, there's cameras here, so don't embarrass my dad. But um, you know, the reality is kids don't think like, like adults do, and everyone here knows that. And so a one-time session of, all right, you know, there's a, a meeting in class today, prosecutor Sunday's coming, he's gonna tell you drugs are bad. I walk in, everyone, drugs are bad, and the kids are, okay, we know drugs are bad, it's over. That's not gonna cut it. It has to be a, re a, a repeated <clears throat> drumbeat of this message that can't ever stop. I, w I would say, um, I, you know, and I, of course, I'm only dealing with the deaths. But I would say in our cases where people have died to this addiction, to this disease, um, the common denominators are several things. Um, sometimes there's been trauma in their life, um, quite often actually. There's been some sort of childhood or adverse childhood experience, uh, whether it be you know growing up in a single parent home with uh, you know or having some sort of sexual abuse or childhood trauma of some sort. Um, sometimes they come from perfectly seemingly healthy homes, uh, healthy relationships, and so on. Um, but they get caught up in whatever's going on with their peers. Um, and, and that's another segment. Um, but, um, you know, many of them start out, they don't start out with the intention of using heroin. Um, the common denominator that we see more often than not is that they all the majority, I wouldn't say all, but the majority were once prescribed some sort of painkiller um, for like, let's say a sports injury or dental surgery um, or something. They get hooked on that painkiller within a short period of time and they switch to heroin in their 20s and 30s. Uh, and that's what we see um, the, the majority of the time. Uh, we actually see people in their 60s now who are on, who were on oral pain pills that have switched over to heroin because it's cheaper. Uh, we actually heard uh, of a case a couple weeks ago of a woman in her 80s who is on heroin because her nephew who lives with her provided it to her because they couldn't get any more pain pills for her. Um, and so you would be amazed. Um, uh, you know, it is something that people can function with. They can work for a while. Um, they can hide it from their families. Um, and so um, there's, there's actually, they say, the food service industry is one of the highest affected by this epidemic. Um, so you would be amazed probably every day who you come into contact with who uh, is addicted to opioids. And we're not just talking heroin and fentanyl, we're talking oxycodone and oxycontin. So on. But we just can't blame uh, family, uh, medication that a doctor prescribed. A person like myself, when I went to high school, I got high. I smoked pot. From pot, I just kept moving on to what was in at that time. But it's an addiction. Right. And it is actually an illness. It's a disease. There's and, actually a chemical component right. to it. I had a lot of friends that went through school. When we got out of school, they went into service. They did this. They did. But they quit all the foolishness. Myself, I continued. I had no way to stop. Mm -hmm. It took me until I was 30 years old to go into a rehab, put myself in, and you absolutely yourself have to want to quit. Mm -hmm. No one's going to tell you. Today was saying, you know, we got to stop these people. If they have the illness, you're not going to stop until they decide to stop. It's That's true. Thank you. That's exactly what we what we hear all the time, and what we also hear is that. They're not using to get high anymore. The high is long gone. They're using just to have some sort of normalcy so that they feel okay, so that they can go on day by day um, to fight the withdrawal, basically. Um, and, and we hear that over and over again. And along those lines, uh, you know, I, I the, you hear a lot of, um, well, you, a lot of people often refer to uh, individuals that, that die of an overdose or that are using as almost just like a moral failing. And... You know, I would argue that that's not necessarily the case. Um, a lot of people make choices in the beginning, but at some point, those choices are over, and it owns them. And I know that because, you know, as a prosecutor, one of the things that I have done repeatedly over the years is review, you know, cell phone records of people that have died. And so I have a window into their mind right before death, and no one knows they're gonna die that's using. 
And so you see text messages where people are communicating with each other. And I will tell you, I have never seen one text message where someone said, I can't wait to get high tonight. I have never seen it. And that's after going through way more phones than you would ever want to imagine. It's, I hate myself, I hate myself, I hate myself, over and over again. And, and I can tell you that that is the majority of the people. And so that doesn't sound like fun. That sounds absolutely terrible. Men and women? Absolutely. Oh, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And, and I think one of the things that people don't realize and that I've been trying to be very vocal about, and some people know that I'm very vocal about it, but, um, you know, when I first started doing this job as coroner, I really had very little addiction experience other than what I went through with a niece who um, was addicted to cocaine and alcohol. And I raised her children for five years, uh, had custody of them. So I knew what it did to families. However, I didn't totally understand the disease process, even as a nurse. Um, but quickly learned the disease process, the chemistry behind it. We had a wonderful doctor, Dr. Levin, who explained it to us at the Heron Task Force when we first started meeting. Um, you know, and I finally, a light went on when I understood the whole chemistry behind opioid addiction, addiction in general, uh, and how there's dopamine receptors and pleasure receptors that get fired up, and some people much more higher than others. Um, and they have that tendency then to be more easily addicted. Um, and so, one of the things that inter that really caught our attention in the coroner's office, uh, and I will say this in my chief deputy both, and he's been doing this for 20 some years, and also law enforcement before that for 20 years, um, was the common denominator that we saw was everybody was dying when they were trying to, when they had just come through a period of abstinence. Um, so the deaths were related to a, a period of abstinence and they would start to use again. So either they had just been clean, just got out of rehab, just got out of jail, um, and they don't have the tolerance built up with opioid addiction. They use at the same level that they once were using at and they die sometimes the very first time they use after being clean all those months or years. That was so tragic to us to, to realize that. Um, what we didn't see was we hardly had any deaths from people who were on medication, uh, medi medi medication assisted treatment, methadone, suboxone, Vivitrol. Now, I'm not saying that people don't die from methadone and suboxone, because they do. But it's very rare in our office to see that. Um, we actually see many more deaths from heroin and fentanyl after a period of abstinence. So I started thinking a little bit about that and researching a little more. And of course I had been the mentality, you're replacing one thing with another. That's the mentality I'd been raised as. Um, and that's what I went into the job as. But when I realized that people were surviving and getting their lives back sometimes and getting their kids back with a slow wean towards sobriety eventually as your total goal, um, it made much more sense to me that people were um, getting, if they got proper counseling support with medication assisted treatment, there is hope. And there are people that can, while there are some that can get, you know, get to a point of sobriety, total abstinence with this opioid addiction, the majority do better with medicated, medication assisted treatment. Um, and that made sense to us in the coroner's office. And that's what we see, people that are slowly trying to get to that point of sobriety. And we have to think outside the box with this because you know what? What's been happening, what's been going on, the abstinence only isn't working. They are dying, dying. I see it every day. And you know, we have to start to realize that just like people are on medications for chronic illnesses like blood pressure, their nerves, like anti-anxiety drugs and things like that, you know, I give this example. Let's say a pastor looks over his congregation and there would be a bubble above everybody's head telling what meds they were on. We got to stop judging the user who's trying to get clean for using medication-assisted treatment. We gotta start letting them into AA groups. We gotta start giving them the tools that they need um, in church 12-step programs and accepting the fact that, you know what, just like I might need an anti-anxiety med, they might need methadone to get their life back to some sort of normalcy. And, you know, the judging and the forcing total abstinence all the time is killing them. We've got to start to think outside the box. 
Most of them uh, are abstinence-only type programs. Um, yeah, and um, that's you know not saying that there aren't some that are starting to branch out and look at some of that. Uh, there are definitely medication-assisted programs out there, but most of the time the person's on their own with those. Uh, they go to clinic or they go for counseling and support if they work their program right. Um, but they're, they're, they're virtually shunned from a lot of 12-step programs because of the fact that they are using medication. And, and one of the things we're doing with the, uh, some people might be familiar with uh, drug treatment court, the different treatment courts we have in your county. Um, one of the things that we're looking at right now is, ex well, we, we are expanding it and including um, to, we have an opioid, opioid court now. And one of the things we're looking at is incorporating medically assist medical assisted treatment into that opioid court. And that's something that previously has and we have not done. Going back to what I said previously as a young prosecutor that hasn't dealt with this before, um, a lot of times, you know, for those that don't use, you can't imagine what people are going through. Well, a lot of times you can sort of see it can be illustrated by people's behavior. And the first one I saw at a case come across my desk, uh, there was a lady that lived um, in, in the Hanover area and she would drive into the city of York every day and she would drive in in the morning and she would get heroin and she would go home and get high. Uh, she would go to work. After work, she'd come back, do it again, do it a third time in the evening. Um, and this went on for years, like years and years and years. And then one day she uh, drove into the city and she didn't have any money on her at that point. And so she got her heroin from a drug dealer, she got in her car and she took off. And so um, when she left, the drug dealer chased her, shot at her as she was trying to drive away. Um, shut out her back window or side mirror and whatever else, but she made it. She got away, she went back home. And I'm reading this, I, I'm reading this case file, and I'm thinking, my God, I have no doubt. I mean, you would think as a, as a normal human being, you would get home and say, you know what? I got ripped off by a drug dealer, or I ripped off a drug dealer. They shot at me. Time for me to change my life. That's what a, someone who thinks in a normal fashion, that's what you would do. Okay, what did she do? Four hours. Where did she go four hours later? Right back. She went right back, but she went to a different part. And she found a new dealer, and she started buying again. And so she, a couple weeks went on, and uh, someone told her, you know, the, that person you ripped off has people that want to shoot you. And she still, it didn't matter to her. That's how diseased her brain was. She literally, that had no bearing on her decision making. She continued to drive in and drive in, and what ultimately happened was, sure enough, she, the one night she's in there and uh, someone knocks on her window, and she looks up and she was shot three times. Um, she, by, by the amazing work of the emergency room physicians at York Hospital, she lived. And uh, the, he was actually 16 at the time. The 16-year-old that shot her, uh, he was prosecuted. He was convicted of attempted uh, first-degree murder. He's serving a sentence of 20 to 40 years, which is a statutory max, maximum sentence for attempted first-degree murder. And, um, but the takeaway is that's how she, I mean, she, she needed it. And, I, and she explained it just like Pam said earlier, because I talked I talk to her. I still do. And she said, I, if I didn't use, I would get so violently ill and so she just kept getting high to keep going. And so that's an illustration of what people will do and under the circumstances, and that's a mild one actually. And thank you for Kyle for bringing that up. That's, as time went on, I mean, there's some that I wouldn't repeat in this room, but. I would, um, I always throw this out lately because I'm on a kick right now because I'm reading this book. But I would really encourage you, if you, if you don't, if you want to understand more about how we got to this point, um, read the book Dreamland, if you haven't read it yet. Um, but it, it really talks about how drugs that were originally intended for end-of-life care for cancer patients who we really shouldn't be worrying about them getting addicted, they prescribed these strong drugs for them and you know, invented these drugs just for that purpose, were suddenly now in the 90s being used for all kinds of acute pain. Um, and that's, many people will tell you that it only takes one prescription, you don't even have to get a refill, and you're hooked on, some people are hooked on the oxys um, and some of those drugs. So um, that's, that's an amazing book that will tell you how we got to the mess that we're in and how it's gonna be a while before we see a reversal. In November, I ran to the emergency room with a kidney stone. 
gave me, I'm not even going to tell you how many Percocets. He said, you're, you're going to pass this in five days. I had enough Percocets for two months if I took four a day. What's being done to prevent that from happening? I mean, shouldn't something be done? There are some things being done. Um, a matter of fact, there's going to be restrictions on the emergency doctors uh, prescribing those. Kevin, did you want to say anything about that? Or I don't know where Kristen went. But yeah, Kristen stepped away. Okay. There are a couple bills in both the House and the Senate right now that would address that. So they are going to address it. They are trying to address it. We, we work with OSS and WellSpan right now. Uh, we have some of those docs are on our opioid collaborative and they are really trying to change some of the prescribing practices um, and have done some made some progress I'm not going to ask what hospital you went to um, but um, I will say that you know there are going to be some big changes coming along the pike with the emergency departments um, and I think uh, unfortunately you had maybe <coughs> A, a bad experience, but I know I that they're, experience. yeah, shocking. and it is, it is shocking. I, I realize that because even on. a year ago, people were walking out with three and four months worth of, uh, but that, that, that is changing, um, probably not fast enough, but it is changing. Um, and it is, um, it's a mindset too, uh, because of the fifth vital sign, which I won't go into all the detail, but it has to do with, um, any, anybody who's in healthcare understands that whole pain, um, scale that they ask you on a scale zero to 10. And, and they're asking my father-in-law last night, 94 years old, Alzheimer's dementia, doesn't understand or care anything that they're saying to him, but they're asking him on a scale of one to 10. I had to say, please stop, because you guys always do this, and he can't tell you. He can't tell you, um, but if they're required to ask it. Um, they don't get reimbursements if they don't ask it. They, they want to keep their, um, their <coughs> patients free of pain. And so that's really what, uh, unfortunately, has con that has also contributed to the mess that we're in. Um, and that was actually started and encouraged by the big pharmaceutical companies, um, along with uh, the accreditation agencies that accredit the hospitals. So when you, um, you know, go and delve into the history, it's just amazing. But it's 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 changing, not fast enough. Uh, one of the things that we have now is the prescription drug database in Pennsylvania. We were number 49 out of 50 to get it. Um, but we're finally making progress there where they can see who's been doctor shopping and pharmacy shopping. So these are all things that have happened in just the last four years. Um, but again, like you said, obviously there are still problems. Yep. I am a doctor. So WellSpan has been working on this issue for nine years. Uh, since I've been at WellSpan, uh, I came from the Washington metropolitan area. Actually, you mentioned Dreamland. Sam Quinones, the mm -hmm. author, is going to be at the Pulo Center yes, I saw that. on. <laughs> okay. I'm, I, I Twitter. I follow him on Twitter. <laughs> on April 31st, I believe. Uh, yeah, I think I saw April somewhere 31st. In there. Yeah. Around that time, uh, you can look online, and he will be talking. Uh, and we at Wellspan are using that as an opportunity to really help educate the community and we are working with our own physicians through um, uh, this process. The CDC came out with guidelines for physicians on prescribing uh, and the legislation that you're talking about comes out of CDC guidelines and recommendations for physicians in practicing, but we have that dilemma that you talked about in the book where uh, pain was the fifth vital sign that we were supposed to treat. So it became <coughs> imbalanced uh, the way prescribing happened. And so we're in a process of retraining our physician population to more recent information that's available to us on what's appropriate for our patient population. So that is happening. It's not an easy process when you have um, uh, persons that have been in practice, trained in different areas, and 
what we're trying to do is make sure we include the multidisciplinary aspect of care management for people with chronic pain so they don't get into that cycle of pain medications using behavioral health and alternatives, integrative health. And what I have been personally trying to do and trying to generate energy around is what I was used to in the Washington metropolitan area where there was uh, acupuncture, auricular acupuncture detox that was used just needles in the ear of patients that could be used to help detox from uh, drugs and for pain management. In the state of Pennsylvania, you cannot do that unless you're a certified acupuncturist. In other jurisdictions throughout the United States, predominantly, you are able to train like a CRMP or somebody else to do that protocol and help groups of patients um, detox and get behavioral health management. And because of the legislation in uh, Pennsylvania, that opportunity is not available. So that is one of my passions, to try to get that comprehensive support of patients as they're trying to uh, manage their chronic pain so they will not get on opioids, or detox if they have problems with opioids. So um, like I said, we've been working on it for nine years before the quote-unquote epidemic because uh, as a system at Wellspan, we could see the trajectory of what was happening. And actually, we started working the chronic pain CET and uh, Dr. Bob Fawcett on that legislation more than four years ago. It took us, I'm thinking, at least six years ago before the legislation, and it took another two years to implement the legislation for us to be able to see what was going on at the pharmacies to even know what our patients were on from other prescribers. So this has been a long haul and a lot of work that's being done, and I am really sorry you got that experience, but if you could raise the awareness of that doctor, that's important to do as well. So, you know, we're all a community. We need to work together. It's not just one person's responsibility. It's everyone sharing that's going to turn this crisis around. Wellspan partnered with us from day one, from day one. And, you know, that's a partnership that has grown to the point now where our executive director of the Opioid Collaborative is a, a medical doctor uh, from Wellspan. And so... Um, OSS has come on board. It, OSS has come on board, too. Right. Um, and so that's fantastic. And just, I mean, to highlight, you know, one of the interesting things was, uh, and I know that the medical community was, I believe, pushing for this for a long time, which you know, is people to take their um, unused prescription pills and take them to, um, you know, drop boxes. So an interesting thing was we, uh, we got, about three years ago, every police department in your county now has a prescription drop box. And we found there were places in York where the citizens really couldn't get to drop boxes, okay, because they might be elderly, they're in rural places, and so, you know, on a whim, what we did was we created this, this, uh, um, I'll say mobile drop box, and one of our detectives went out with a van, and he went to a senior center, and uh, in three hours, 60 pounds of prescription pain pills, 60 pounds. I mean, think about that. I mean, how small is a pill? I mean, like 60 pounds. I mean, I saw the boxes, like eight boxes like this high. And so that was sitting in people's homes in Delta. Wow. Okay. And so extrapolate that throughout the rest of the county. 
um, the law with regard to what you just stated is wrapped within, and I'm going to start, it's called the Good Samaritan Law. So the Good Samaritan Law is in effect, and what the Good Samaritan Law means is that um, there's two parts to that act. The first part is that, um, so if, if Pam and I are using together and Pam starts overdosing, and Pam is overdosing, okay, and I call 911 and I remain with Pam until help arrives, then according to the law, I can't be charged with, with a crime. Okay. Now, well, the, and that's because people were leaving them to die. Absolutely. And the intent of that law, that's exactly right. I mean, and I can't, I mean, I have so many horror stories of people leaving people to die in terrible ways. But so that's the first part of the act. The second part of the act is what gives uh, police departments, police officers immunity uh, from dispersing naloxone. Okay. And so that's where, so that's that where that law exists. So that then brings us to, you know, what is the situation at hand and how does the law affect it with regard to holding people accountable? Um, so within the criminal justice system, for someone to be held accountable, they have to be arrested. So that's number one. So if someone's not arrested, they're not a part of, of my world, really. Um, and so, for example, drug treatment court. And drug treatment court is, I think it's absolutely fantastic. It's in, it's one of the best things we have going. In your county, our drug treatment court was a national model. And so drug treatment court, for someone to be in drug treatment court, they have to be arrested. And so to be arrested, they have to, then they have to plead guilty. They have to take ownership of what they've done. And drug treatment court's not easy. Like drug treatment court isn't hangout time. Drug treatment court is about a year and a half of checking in with the judge, getting a job, um, community service, all kinds of stuff. So that's the first component. The second part of it is um, when people deliver drugs and the other person dies, then we've been obviously investigating those cases. We charge drug delivery resulting in death. If the facts sustain that, and if, it's, if the facts sustain that, then we do it, okay? Now, going back to naloxone, and, and the reason I started with those two points was because we had to remove all those additional factors before we address this. So when someone is saved with naloxone, let's say they're saved 100 times, okay? Um, there are only a few different options available. Option one is don't save them, okay? That's an option. Police can just say, you know what? I'm not carrying naloxone. I'm not doing it, and you died. That's option one. I think as, and you alluded to, you know, where's the human, I mean, I think as, as human beings, as public servants, first and foremost, our duty is the preservation of life and do no harm under all circumstances. And I can tell you right now, knowing the police officers in your county, that's never going to happen. They're not going to stop doing it. End of story. So the second part is when is that person held accountable? Okay. Um, there has been some laws that have been proposed where, for example, someone might be, you know, an Narcan maybe two or three times, and on the third time, all right, you have to do certain things, or you, or maybe you'll get charged with a crime. Um, and so I know that there is legislation pending that is geared towards addressing that. Um, the issue is there's not enough treatment. That's it, and that's, there's just not enough yeah. beds available. Yep, and you know, you. You know, part of the problem is we as a society have, and this is the nurse in me, so excuse me. We as a society have got to realize that this is a disease. Mm -hmm. And it's a chronic disease. And, you know, it's not a cure. Naloxone is not a cure. And none of us have ever said it was a cure. You have to look at this like a defibrillator. Uh, we have people all the time who go back and do bad things and make poor choices that are defibrillated over and over again for poor choices, heart disease, um, other things, even diabetes that is adult onset, okay, that um, maybe could have been, you know, things done differently in their life before they got to that point. But as healthcare providers, it is our duty and our responsibility to continue to preserve life and the doctor can print them up a sheet with all kinds of exercises and advice and as soon as they go out that door they can ignore everything that doctor wrote and guess what when they fall over they're going to get defibrillated or they're going to get oxygen or they're going to get uh, insulin 
um, in adult onset, okay? Um, and so that is part of the chronic illness cycle. Um, what's different with this is it's a short period of time because many of them, if they use heroin for a long time, they're not gonna live. There are no old heroin addicts, really. There's opioid addicts who become heroin addicts at older points in their life. But over time, they will die if they don't get treatment. Um, and so this is, um, the, the life-saving measures are in a very uh, consolidated frame of time. And so for many of us who don't use, it just, frustrates us because it's like, why can't they wake up and smell the coffee? Why can't they get their act together? Why are we spending taxpayer money on naloxone, which we're not right now, okay? I want to make sure that people understand that. But that is the question we get all the time. Um, yes, it's taxpayer expense in the resources that are being used. But I will tell you that I would much rather have people living than put a lot of strain and resources on our on my office, Dave's office, with 120 more deaths, which is probably about what we would have if we hadn't had those 284 Narcan saves. And as a prosecutor, I tend towards the path of someone has to be hold, held accountable. And we have, a, there's a, and there's a balancing act that has to take place. And what I mean by that is, so if a police officer goes to Narcan someone, and they're like, all right, this is the fifth time I've been here, I'm arresting you. Well, the actual crime that they would arrest them for is drug possession or paraphernalia, which means they'll go to jail for like 10 hours and they'll be right back because it just doesn't carry a hefty sentence. It's, I mean. If we could yeah. say you have to go to treatment and there was treatment available, yeah. we would all be for it. Uh, we would just, yeah, but there's just not enough treatment. The reality is accountability is. I think that's a vital component. It absolutely is. The other thing I just want to say is the first time they use, it is a choice, but after that, it's a disease. And if you don't believe that, you can't help them. Um, and if you don't believe that, then I encourage you to come understand, come to one of our uh, community presentations and understand the chemistry. Because there is a true chemistry behind and this. Accountability, and the thing about accountability is you have to have a law that can be enforced. Okay, so whatever that statute is, it's got to, there has to be the enforcement mechanism available you know, or else it does, or it has no effect on society. Okay, and so what I mean by that is, one of the things that law enforcement was pushing, and I actually, I think is a great idea, was having the option to um, do. So there's a thing called a 302 mental health warrant, and that's if someone is a danger or threat to themselves, uh, then you can get a warrant where they're taken physically by the police and they're taken to the hospital, and they can be there for up to 72 hours. And you know why isn't there a similar thing for someone who's repeatedly using? And I think that's a wonderful idea. And you know that's a topic of debate. And boy, how fantastic is that? Let's do it. The problem that I was told, and this is the reality, is where do you put them? Right. Because there is no secured facility that exists to put all these people in. But who's going to call the police to have them take it? Exactly. Well, then that's the other part as well. Part yeah. Exactly. Well, and I will say there is a component course. though that we've worked yeah. around with that. That's somewhat of an accountability thing, uh, where. We have the warm handoff program now at, at all the area hospitals where we get a uh, recovering uh, addict themselves in there who's a certified specialist, recovery specialist, who talks to them and tries to get them into treatment uh, right away, rather than waiting an hour or two when they're feeling better and they go right back out on the street. So that is one sort of workaround that we're doing right now to try and get them to be accountable. Uh, we can't force it, but uh, it's actually had uh, some success. Um, it's not, 24%. yeah, I mean, so um, that's been going on since uh, December or uh, a year ago. And, um, and then, you know, another point, and I'll get to this, just gentleman has a question right here, but and there's another point I want to make, and this is, and so um, this is absolutely vital to understand when you're talking about the accountability component to this. Studies overwhelmingly show that if you take someone who is a, like a nonviolent offender, okay, someone who just uses drugs, who doesn't commit crimes of violence or things of that nature, and you incarcerate them, you are now statistically creating someone who will commit more crimes, and they will be worse than the crimes that person committed before they went in prison. And so as a society, a choice has been made, the will of the people spoken through the legislature, to create and act laws 
that omit for filling prisons with people that are low risk offenders. And so, I mean, this is a, I mean, it's a much larger question than we can even address sitting here. But the reality is that's why we have our reentry programs. That's why we have our drug treatment program. That's why we have all kinds of like supervised bail programs where we do everything we can to keep hold people accountable, but keep them out of prison. And so that's a very important component to this that has to be taken into consideration. I, and I want to point one thing out about that. And this, this may sound a little weird, but, uh, Sometimes I look at Facebook and I look at those comments and it, it, it takes everything I have not to respond to them, to let them die especially. Um, and, I, and I actually go back to the people that responded and said that and I look at their Facebook page and lots of partying going on. And I, and I find it hard to understand how somebody can be so judgmental when they've got all that baggage in their own life. You can go to any physician and they can prescribe you naloxone. It won't stay on your medical record as if you are the user, so there's not going to be anything that's going to, quote, you know, damage your medical record or maybe your reputation. So you can get that yourself to use for any friends or family members that you're concerned about. That's one thing. And the second thing. Uh, I told you I work at Wellspan. We have um, a chronic pain education series that we're going to be starting up. Information is going to come out in March. We're going to start up in April, both here and across uh, over in Ephrata and Lancaster, to educate people on chronic pain management and multidisciplinary approaches to that. We're going to include behavioral health, Center for Mind Body Health with massage, acupuncture, yoga, deep breathing, relaxation training, physical therapy, occupational therapy, a, a multidisciplinary um, education program. And I am the physician instructor talking about medications, changes uh, in your body, your brain. So I just want you to know that there are things coming out that's going to be available to the public. We did a pilot last year that worked very well, and we're expanding that for the community. The thing that people have to remember is somebody can get clean, and um, they can be clean for a while. And you know, you send them back to their same triggers, their same problems. Um, and if you don't address those underlying problems, it's much easier for them to start using again than to deal with all their problems. Uh, and we are dealing with a very a, a society that's just got huge problems. Um, and so we have to be able to offer them that support on how to cope with those issues or they're going to continue to use. There is hope. We want people to understand that. We always like to say that and explain that. We see great stories every day. Um, many of you, uh, or some of you here today, shared your story of recovery. And um, so there is, there's a lot of hope out there. Um, but this is, many people will say, this is one of the worst oppressive epidemics of drug addiction that we have seen in our entire country. Um, you know, the U.S. uses 90-some percent of the opioids that are prescribed in this world. You realize that? We have 90 some percent. Um, we have a huge problem with learning how to deal with pain. And I think it's not just physical pain in many people's lives. I think it's triggered from their emotional pain. Uh, and so that, that's the real issue here. And I, and I appreciate that. And, and one last thing, I mean, there is a lot of, there's a lot of hope. There's a lot of inspiration out there. And we see it every single day. And there are so many people that are working diligently in their world and what they do to make this better. And it's a community, and it's, this is going to be a community response, and it will happen. This will be turned around. And I believe that from the bottom of my heart. I have no doubt it's going to happen. Um, and, you know, and, and that involves people working together that traditionally may not get along, may not have the same uh, political th thoughts and views, uh, may have different views on how, I mean, this is a full community response. 
and that's the only way that this will ever be fixed. And that is what we have for the most part. So, uh, but that being said, you know, I'm very appreciative of everyone, you know, being here. I'm appreciative. I mean, I thought the dialogue was Good great. Good questions. Great Excellent questions. questions. Yeah. And, you know, the questions that ask have to be the tough ones. Because if we sit here and just talk about things that are just have a nice, normal conversation where we don't get, you know, to the, I'll say we take a deep dive into the issue, then um, then we're never going to solve the problem. And so I'm very thankful for the tough questions tonight, and I'm very thankful for the dialogue, and, and thank you for, I mean, the information that you provided us. Uh, that was fantastic. And one of the first things yeah. that you can do, personally, is go home and get rid of all those old and unused prescriptions. Take them to your police department, get rid of them. Um, because uh, every day we take bags and bags out of people's homes when they die, and you know, it's just, they, they need to be destroyed so that there's less chance of other people coming across them and diverting them.